And welcome back. And today we've got a very special guest. We've got a, a one of the original players in the game, I guess. He's been, been in the space since 1987 and probably even before that. And yeah. it's David A. Smith. He's from over in Los Angeles and he's kind enough to join us. He's involved with Croquet, which is building an operating system, OS for the metaverse. And David, welcome. Thank you very much. It's nice to be here. It's going to be fun. Yeah. And first of all, because I'll ask more, most of my guests in this space this, what does the metaverse mean to you? And can you just start wherever you want? Yeah, that's a really good question because it's, you know, such a, on, on the one hand, it's an older concept. You know, Neil Stevenson, who coined the idea, certainly had something in mind. Uh, I have a particular definition that I think is actually pretty accurate. It, you know, you think about the metaverse as a kind of medium, but most importantly to me, it's a communication medium. In other words, it's a space that allows you and I to create and share ideas dynamically. It's, it's going to get, uh, I, I, I know, for example, it's going to get very, very powerful. So you'll be able to literally say something and uh, whatever you say, uh, a fully engaged AI uh, is going to be part of that conversation is going to generate a simulation of the thing that you described. And wow. then all the other participants in that space are going to be able to reach in there and engage with it, modify it. So basically, think of that as a conversation where I say something, the world has changed and expanded, and then we actually get something to play with, work with, to, um, uh, to you know, sort of explore ideas. And this could be a mathematical space, a physical space. But the, the way to think about it really is primarily a communication environment, a communication platform. Uh, and I think that's why it's so incredibly important. Uh, I, I think um, I, I've, I've said before, you're defined more by how you communicate than anything. And so this whole transformation of this metaverse is going to uh, change what we are, change the way we think. Uh, and uh, I, I, this, is, this is kind of a central theme of what I've been working on, actually, because mm. um, language is sort of like this uh, virtual machine running on your brain. You know, yeah. you, you think in terms of language. Your, your basic brain doesn't have anything to do with language, but when you impose language on top of it, all of a sudden you can think things. You think in terms of languages, right? You can think things and say things uh, that you couldn't otherwise do. And, and, that, and that, that thinking, that, you know, using the language to understand and, 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 and communicate, it transforms you ver in a very deep way. Language is... Um, it is a, a very, very, very powerful thing. But it's really interesting. There's other kinds of languages. Mathematics is another kind of language. You use, communicate and explore very complex ideas. Uh, you know, it's necessary for physics. Music's another language. Mm. You, know, you think about anybody who uh, is a musician understands that you're communicating ideas. When I play jazz, you know, you see my guitars back here. Uh, I've yes. got a great guitars. But... Uh, when I play with other people, I'm communicating with them. I'm sharing ideas. The metaverse is the same idea. Metaverse is this virtual machine that's going to be running on your brain that's going to allow you to explore and share ideas that are far more complex and compelling than anything we can do today. And in the same way, it's going to transform you. The person who has language is so much different from the person who doesn't. The person who understands mathematics is a very different perspective on the world. Uh, obviously, musicians is the same thing. Hmm. Uh, the metaverse is going to be have a profound impact on the nature of what we are. And where do you see the state of play today, with, especially with like virtual reality, augmented reality? I mean, everything to do with mixed reality, really. So I'm just basically I'm asking about extended reality, but where do you see how this all plays out, how it's playing out? And are we going at a quite an accelerated rate since, say, 2020? You know, when you're on an exponential curve, you don't usually see it, but we're mm. beginning to, you know. Um, it, AR and VR, and I've been doing that for a long, long time, it, they're fundamentally hard uh, technical challenges. Uh, you know, the, the way that the, um, the humans work, you know, how we perceive things, 
um, how we engage with things. Uh, it, there, there's a uh, the the challenge is we have to figure out how to use AR and VR as amplifiers of our intent. And, and I use an example is is the mouse. I happen to have one right here, as you probably do. A mouse is a powerful thing. What it does is, you know, you, I, I'm moving it a few inches, but I have six feet of screen in front of me, and I'm able to move my mouse from one end of this thing to the other. It's amplifying my ability to engage with all this information that's arrayed in front of me, and and then I can click on something and drag it around and interact with it. You know, the, it, it's a magical device. But what's really magic is it's almost no work. You know, I have a little area about this big that. Yeah that I work on, right? You do too. And yet I'm still able to encompass this huge space. We're tool users. We know, we know how to project our, our, our bodies into space. You hold a stick and you push something. That's kind of the same idea. The mouse is kind of the virtual stick in this virtual 2D landscape that we have in front of us. And, and so and that, that wasn't an accident, by the way. Doug, Doug Engelbart was, and Bill English invented the mouse, and they went through a hundred different kinds of iterations of, uh, of user interface devices. They had even you know, knee pedals and foot pedals and things like that. Uh, you know, that there was the light, the touch, light pen where you hold up something. Light pen failed for a very, very good reason, which is you know, put your arm up in the air and hold it. And try to hold it there for, you know, Five minutes, you will mm. be sweating. You'll be yeah. tired. And what that what that tells you is that the model of in, user interaction uh, isn't you know you, you don't want to put your hand up and pick, pick things. You know it, it, you get tired. You can do that with a tablet, but the tablet's down and you're and you're dragging it around, or your phone's the same thing. That there's something to rest on. So so when we design AR VR platforms, going back to the original question is the design parameters that we think are the right things, like putting your hands up in the air and trying to manipulate things, are exactly the wrong thing. I, I did a project, actually even before I did my game out in the early 80s, where I was controlling a, a Puma 560 robot arm, that's a big industrial robot, with a thing called a data glove. And the way it worked is we had this pneumoelastic finger a hand and you could use it to pick things up, right? And so I'm controlling it remotely. And what would happen is, at, like I said before, after about five minutes, I was sweating because your arm is really heavy. And then when you want to do very fine manipulation, you have to basically stiffen your arm. You have to stiffen the whole system. That means hmm. that you have agonist, antagonist uh, muscle groups working against each other to keep it uh, sta stable. That's why you start sweating, because even though you look like you're not doing anything, you're working really, really hard. And so when people design systems to like, I'm gonna do this, because it's really natural and obvious, but it's also absolutely wrong. <laughs> you get, it, doesn't, it doesn't work, it doesn't scale, and you can't, you can't do that all day long. You can't even do it for five minutes. So one of the challenges of designing next generation AR to, uh, VR mixed reality devices is we're not taking you know kind of the real problems into account, uh, and, and that's yeah. a perfect example. Just the the hand interaction is like you really don't want your hands up in the air. Better to have them in your pocket where you have little manipulators like micro mice and stuff like that, where you can still get the same app capability. You know, when I use a tool like the mouse, I can I can move my virtual hand over to the right to the left instantly and with, with very, very little effort. I, I think my number one rule of user interface design is this. It should be invisible. If yeah. I see you doing something, the user interface is failing. So when I mm. see people doing this in, in VR and AR, the user interface is failing. Now that's just one aspect. The other part, of course, is the actual wearable devices, getting the optics right, uh, it used to be people were thinking, oh, we get sick inside these systems. Why? Because update rates weren't fast enough. But there was another reason that people aren't taking into account, which is 
that you can see stuff from the side. It's very low resolution, but you see it. And you have this motion cue. In fact, the, your primary motion cues are, are, are literally the motion along your, your peripheral vision. And the pro one of the major reasons people get sick is you see this big thing changing here. You know, you got this field that you're moving through or you're walking through, but nothing's changing here. So your brain is confused. It's like, okay, this isn't happening, but this is. That usually, that, that, that's the kind of thing that makes you nauseous. So the, the answer was sometimes, oh, we'll make the visual field smaller, which means that some of this area in the middle is, is still static, so you don't get as bad. But the real answer is actually make the field of view much wider. Uh, one of the things I did, I was a senior fellow at Lockheed Martin for five years, and I led their AR and VR work, and we built a head mount with a 180-degree field of view. And when you put wow. that on, you don't get sick because all of your, every bit of the information going into your eye and hence into your brain made sense. You still had a little bit of motion issues, but that was nowhere near as bad as the, the discomfort of part of your eye seeing one thing and the other part seeing the other. So these are the challenges that ha you, we, we face in designing these systems. And, you know, it, it, it's the sad thing is in the old days, people designed based upon what we need to make, what we need to make humans comfortable and happy and powerful. And now we think we, we're, we're, we don't understand all those lessons from, you know, decades ago. And so we're just building things that, oh, this looks right. Well, that's not the right answer. That's not the, the way it has mm. to work. Anyway, you got me on to my soapbox and I had to say that because those, those are a couple of things Fair that enough. drive me nuts when people are building systems. However, I do think we're going to get there. I do think that yeah. the next generation of wearable devices is getting better all the time. Uh, mm. and, uh, and the, the performance, and the, one of the things that's really, really important to me and to anyone is the performance of the, the, the graphics as an example. And, yeah. um, so I, and here, here's a, a little bit of perspective. I, you know, Apple developed this wonderful M1 and now M2 chip and, uh, and they put it in the Mac and it's like so clear to me. So clear, it's a very high performance, very low powered chip, right? Yeah. What's that really for? Because they don't really care that much about the Mac. I mean, it's a nice business and all, but that's not why they made that chip. They made it for AR and VR. High performance graphics, low power, wearable. That's obvious. Yep. So so that was like one of the things that, that, that Apple really gets a lot of this in a very, very deep way. And of course, I don't know, I, 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 I was a, I've been a huge fan of Apple for, for many, many years. So my expectation is I think they're going to probably take the, a lot of the right, make a lot of the right decisions uh, mm. about this. And so they're going to be the ones to watch. But I also think it's the best thing that could happen to the industry if, for Apple to take a lead because they did the same thing with the iPhone. And the yes, iPhone forced the Android to appear. I mean, Google was so afraid because... Google's a lot of Google's business was mobile. You know, basically they had the mobile browser on on on, I, on iPhones, and so they were scared, and they had a right to be because Apple was in a position to kick them out of the search business. And the future of search is mobile, right? I mean, that's today you probably do most of your search on your mobile device, and so they had a reason to be scared. So that's why they wound up, wound up buying Android. And they also modified it to be more like an iPhone, which obviously made Steve Jobs pretty upset. But it was the right thing because now they, they, they first of all, democratized that, the phone business. They gave Apple a competitor, which was really important. And, uh, and so those two platforms, are, I, mean, I, ha I have both, right? I, here's my Android and here's my iPhone. <laughs> and uh, they... They have been going lockstep and leapfrogging each other. So if Apple comes out with something really good, which I think they will, it's going to force yeah. everybody else to say, "Oh my gosh, I've got to jump. I have to. I have to. I have to get at least match them, but even better, jump past them." And I, I think that's what's going to really jumpstart this industry once 
uh, Alan Kay, who is my mentor and the person I've been working with forever, I'll, I'll tell you that story in a little bit, but he, he, he said that the Macintosh was the first computer worthy of criticism. It was good enough to criticize. And that's what we want. I mean, I, I think a lot of the devices out there are fun, but they're not really worthy of criticism quite yet. They're not there. And I think if Apple does what I think they can do, that device is going to be worthy of criticism, and that's going to be a very important milestone. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of speculation at the moment about the AR headset coming out of coming out for Apple. I mean, it's in going into early last year to 2022. Yeah. There was there's a lot of say, talk about the Apple when the Apple the glass is coming out. But I think that's really I think they hit the nail right on the head there. I also like to wind back a little bit. We when we talk about mouses, where do you see the likes of say haptic and haptic gloves? Because I think that's another important area that People don't really yeah. realize. That is so hard. Uh, so when I was doing that project with the robotics, it was really an interesting challenge because you can't feel, right? Mm. And um, and how do you create transducers? How do you create things that allow you to feel the haptics and tact tactile? Uh, it, it, it's it's a very very difficult problem. I, I could, we, we, one of the things we were studying. It's like, um, it turns out, as an example, if you numb your hand and you try to put a key in a keyhole, you can't do it. It's like, you, yeah. you, you, part of it is obviously visual, you're kind of lining it up, but if you can't feel the keyhole with the edge of that key, and this is, again, this is sort of like humans being tool users, because you, you feel through the object, you can't do it. You literally can't do it. That, what that tells me, though, isn't that we have to have haptics and tactic, tactile sensing, although those would be great. What we have to is rethink the problem. Yeah. And, and not, you know, everybody's like, oh, I'm going to do and put my arm up in the air and I'm going to feel stuff. And it's like, no, that, that may not be the right answer. The right answer may be um, have something that is, you know, interoperable with your hand that you can touch and feel. Uh, I mean, a good example is a phone is an incredibly good tactile device. I mean, I can feel it. You know, I can, you know, I feel that, that sense of, and, and, and as I do stuff, you can see it's, it, it works. That, that, that's kind of the closer to the right answer, uh, you know, holding something up like this and then, you know, interacting with it and, 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 and using that as, as the way I, I, I engage. Maybe maybe the right approach, but trying to put something on your hand, just think about your hand's already heavy, you put a, a, a haptic device on it, it's now way heavier, and sure, you're going to be able to feel stuff, but why is that the way you want to interoperate with something? Why is that why you want to uh, engage? So I'm not sure that's the right answer. Right. Uh, I, I, in fact, I'd say my, my opinion is you're going in the wrong direction if you're trying to recreate real reality with this stuff because the real reality we're, we had no choice about having to engage with the world this way it was like that's the way the world works but we're talking about a metaverse where it's totally virtual we have way more choices about how we engage with it because like like i said the mouse it doesn't match the way humans work I, you know i'm moving this thing an inch and it's moving one two three feet well, the real world doesn't work that way. So why would I constrain a mouse? I mean, it's like saying, well, I have to move a mouse a foot to, to move it a foot. That's, you don't have a big enough desk to do that. So, so that's the point, is mm. think the problem in a very different way. Don't yeah. try to solve the problem of being in the real world in the metaverse, because that's not the right answer. You, you, we're talking about amplifying human capabilities, not limiting to what we have, to, what we do every day now. So that, I think that's really, a, it's a, a point of view problem, really, when you, yeah. when you look at it that way. So I, I don't see haptics and uh, tactile sensing as that important, because I, I think if you're trying to solve that, you're, sol you're, you're failing uh, at, at a fundamental level. Yep. And when we first chatted, but if we're now back in the pre screening call, you're talking about closing the interactive loop. Can you enlighten my listeners about what that means and what this means for further metaverse development? Well, um, I, I have this idea, and I, I kind of alluded to it earlier, 
uh, I call it augmented conversation. And that, that's the, what I was talking about is the, the metaverse enables this ability for us to engage with each other uh, as easily we talk about the weather, right? So I, mm. I say something, an AI is a full participant in that environment. Uh, and, and when I say that something, that, that, that AI is going to generate a simulation that we now can engage with, manipulate. And I, I find that, first of all, uh, it, that's very natural. I mean, one of the things, um, you know, when we, we, when we converse, we use our voice, we talk, we use language. It's incredibly powerful, and, and, and you know, when we say things, you know, I, you know, I say, you know, uh, a red bunch of roses immediately generated an image in your head about that, and it's like that's a very powerful thing to be able to do. I create an image uh, by just saying that. Well, imagine that that is that, that idea is reified and, and generated instantly in front of us. And then we say, oh, and it wasn't red, it was pink, or move this over here. And we're seeing that with AI today, right? We're already seeing that. But as a conversational medium, that's extraordinary to be able to say these things. And then you say, oh, what about this? And then I say, what about this? And we go back and forth, and we're having this conversation that is generating this wonderful exploration of, of this virtual space that... I mean, it, it, I think it, it's going to be absolutely magical. Mm. Um, and, and that's why we've been working on this, this project, you know, that, you know, this croquet effort, is how do we enable just that? Because when I talk to you, uh, it's essential that you hear what I say, right? In other words, we're having a conversation, and if, if I say something and you hear something different, then you're going to not trust that, that medium. So what we're really talking about is this idea of a shared truth. What yeah. I see is what you see. Uh, you see what I'm doing as I do it. I pick something up and move it. I, I do this, I do that. And so it has to be as live and real and immediate as the physical world. So I pick up this mouse in front of you and I drag it around and show you. that That's a very visceral and immediate thing. You have no doubt in your mind. You just picked up a bottle and you start... That, that's immediate. I saw that, and and so we know that there's a shared reality. Yeah, of course. Us. So how do you build that? How do you ensure that 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 could be true? And so uh, let me give you a little history uh, of how we got here because I, I think that's really relevant. Um, so my background, uh, I, I wrote the first real-time 3D adventure shooter game. Uh, called The Colony, 1987, and I was just so obsessed with this idea of a virtual world you could go visit and explore. In this case, I wound up building the first real-time 3D game you could walk around and shoot things, and it was, it was amazing. I remember when I was building it, uh, I had this hallway, uh, and I knew, I mean, I could see around, there was a corner at it, uh, there that you turn the, turn the corner there in the hallway, and I knew if I go around that, that corner, the, the application was going to crash. I mean, I'd, I'd written, I knew what was going to happen. This is the earlier days. And I couldn't stop myself. I had to go see what was on the other side. I had to walk, turn that corner. I knew, oh my God, this is so powerful. I have to, I have to, I have to be here. So Colony demonstrated some really key things. One of the facts that, that these virtual worlds are, are wonderful. Um, second thing I did uh, by the way, that what happened after that is uh, Jim Cameron was directing mm. the movie The Abyss at the time. He got a pirated version of the game, and he asked me. He got in touch with me and asked me to uh, recreate the set in my game engine, so he could actually see what the set would look like before it got built. So I did that, and what was wonderful. He saw a whole section of the set would never show up on screen. So he didn't have to build it. That saved him two million dollars, which, by wow. the way, they still haven't paid me. I'm, I'm waiting, but but <laughs> the uh, but that was like okay. Now we're getting it. And this is kind of launched his. Vi he wanted to see the world from inside, right? These virtual worlds. The next thing happened was Tom Clancy, the author, got in touch with me, and uh, he was playing my game. Got really obsessed with that and said, "Hey, I want to do something with you." So two things happened. One, he became my uh, one, my first outside investor and board member. 
uh, with a company I was starting, a, a company called Virtus Corporation, and we did a, the first real-time 3D design tool. We took that idea with, from Cameron, and we built a product that you could actually create real-time 3D worlds and walk around them dynamically. What, you know, you create this. I mean, it, it's kind of there that now it's still not as good as what we did. That was 1990. That won the first breakthrough product of the year from Mac user magazine, by the way. Uh, but it was the first time you could actually do that. I invented portals around that time, or a little bit before that, so that you could actually, you know, cut a hole in a wall, and now you could see into the next room. It wow. was like, that was that was a, a crucial thing. But then Tom and I said, let's do something. He introduced me to the FBI hostage rescue team, uh, and they were using my software for basically planning missions. Um, uh, you know, this Virtus Walkthrough thing, they, they basically say, okay, here's the bad guys, here's the good guys, and, you know, let's, let's save these people. They took me on their training mission, um, uh, they, were, they have these things called battle towns, these big concrete towns, and you're up on an observation uh, tower looking down at this, and then these big black helicopters flew over our heads, and these black clad ninjas came down off, off of ropes onto the top of these buildings, and they start blowing stuff up. And I was like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. I mean, it's loud, it's big. I mean, the helicopter right over your head, you know, it's like, I had never had that happen before. And so I called up Tom and said, we've got to do a game on these guys. It's crazy. And so uh, Tom said, well, you do game, I'll do the book. And that was Rainbow Six. Mm. Uh, and it's like, that, that was, we created yeah. the, the simulated world that, you know, that uh, we had learned from the FBI hostage rescue team, how, what their tactics were, how they work. Uh, Brian Upton was the game designer for that. In fact, he's working with me now at, at Croquet. But the other thing that happened was I started uh, collaborating with Alan Kay. Alan is considered the father of the personal computer. He led the team at Xerox Park that created a computer called the Alto. Uh, he invented this idea of object-oriented programming that we, everyone uses today. He invented overlapping windows. Think about that. Somebody had to invent overlapping windows. And it's like, yeah, it didn't exist, and then it existed. You know, everybody takes it for granted. You don't even think about that being invented. Um, and um, uh, his, his partner there, Dan Ingalls, invented pop-up menus. They had created a language called Smalltalk that allowed them to create these, this virtual paper interface, the bitmap displays on the Alto. And um, what happened was really key. Uh, Steve Jobs came and visited them and saw this interface. Uh, and it blew his mind. He said, uh, "He said what they showed him. They, he, they showed him three things. They showed him object-oriented programming, but he didn't see that. Showed him network computers. They actually invented Ethernet at Xerox Park as well. And so they had a hundred altos all connected via Ethernet, uh, and they could send email and text and everything. He didn't. He said he didn't see that. The, the third thing they showed him was a user interface, and he said it was." the most amazing thing he'd ever seen. And he said within 10 minutes, he knew that every computer was gonna work that way. And every computer and every phone works that way today. He was yeah. right. And and, um, and so, but Alan and I were talking, and so Alan, when he invented this idea, he, he invented via this, he, he created this thing, this idea called a Dynabook. A Dynabook was a, basically a tablet computer. And this tablet computer, and this is, by the way, 1968, they first had the idea. 1972, they wrote it up in a, in a paper called a, a Personal Co Computer for Children of All Ages. But the Dynabook was a magical device. It allowed you to collaborate. He actually tells a story in the paper about two children who are playing in, uh, Space War together, a game. And then they say, oh, well, this is boring. Let's, let's make it harder. And so what they do is open up the code together. I mean, each of them are, are on their own tablet, right? They together open up the code. They make a change to add a gravitational source in the center, a, fo a sun. And, and then uh, they go back to playing the game. And now they're, they're being pulled into the center. And, and, and the game's way more complicated. And the girl still beats the boy. But, that, but what he was talking about was... He, he understood that a computer is a medium, and I was talking about that earlier, hmm. and he, 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 he saw this Dynabook 
this idea, because he had seen uh, the first LCD displays at, at University of Illinois. It was like 16 by 16 pixels. And he realized that you're going to be able to make them this big, and you're going to be able to put a computer later on behind it, because he was aware of Moore's Law. And that. And, and so when they did the Alto, the, the, the other term of the, uh, they used for, to describe the Alto was the interim Dynabook. So the Dynabook, this idea, this tablet computer, is basically what we've been using, but the part of that got lost, and that actually came from Doug Engelbart, going even further back, the guy who invented the mouse, as I was saying earlier. Yeah. And uh, Doug had this, had this, did this demo in 1968 that was mind blowing. It was, it's called the Mother of All Demos. You should go look up on YouTube, search Mother of All De Demos. It'll blow your mind too. And this guy was demonstrating. A computing future that we still haven't quite achieved, where people are collaborating. But he demonstrated the mouse for the first time. He demonstrated hypertext for the first time. He demonstrated uh, video conferencing for the first time. It's '68. You know, this is it's crazy. quite amazing. Actually, uh, sort yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It, it, and and so Alan spent a lot of time with with, with Doug and understood that 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 collaboration, that ability to engage with each other was central. Now, Doug was able to do it because they were all on the same time-sharing computer. That basically, everybody's running on the same computer, so it's very easy to share my world with yours. But at, when the PC shows up via Allen and you know the IBM and a Apple, uh, you couldn't do that anymore. We didn't have that ability to scale. So Alan and I started talking about how do we make that happen. And... Alan said, uh, let's start a project. Let's make it happen. And so we invited David Reed. David, uh, his PhD was uh, at, from MIT. He, had, he was the architect of the UDP protocol. And he was co-architect of TCP IP. We're using that right now. And uh, he's also formulated this concept called Reed's Law, which is the scalability of the internet by, by social groups. But his thesis was this idea of replicated computation. In other words, I have a computer here that's computing something. I have a computer here that's computing something, but they're the same thing, and they're running a bit identical. Uh, and so it was pretty clear. A Alan, in those days, could read everybody, every single computer uh, science thesis out there. So he was, yeah, you know, he, he's, uh, you know, he, he won the Turing Award among other things, besides inventing personal computing as we know it today. So he was aware of this, and so we invited David to join us, and he accepted. And so we built this system that we call Croquet today. The first version was done in Smalltalk. And uh, even though David's original model had never been implemented, we figured out how to do that. And when you do that, when I talked about the share idea of a shared truth, uh, the way Croquet works is I'm running this virtual machine on my computer, and then you join and you make a copy of that virtual machine onto your system and it runs bit identical. And the way what happens, we have a thing called a reflector up in the in the cloud. When I interact with interact interact with this virtual world here, we don't send a message directly to it. We send a message to this reflector. Reflector puts a timestamp on and redistributes it to all the participants. And so that that timestamp uh, it, it, it basically says compute whatever you're doing up to and including this new event that just occurred. And so the computers, uh, my computer and your computer, run bit identically, and at the end of that, they're exactly the same state, even though they both computed something very complicated. Um, and that, uh, it worked. It was, it was yeah. magical. So all of a sudden, I could share even a complex simulation, like I was talking about this, AI generating a simulation. How do I make sure that what you're, that simulation you're engaging with is the same as I, I am? That's how Croquet works. That's what we built. And the first version was done in Squeak Smalltalk, which is what they created at Xerox Park, and then uh, Squeak was a, a more modern variant. And the challenge was some of it Squeak didn't, didn't quite, wasn't quite perfectly synchronized, so we fixed that. Uh, and then, uh, so we, we built that, that system and it worked like a charm. I wound up going to Lockheed Martin for five years as a senior fellow and chief innovation officer, and I led their AR VR work uh, there for um, uh, for the training group. And we implemented the same thing for the Defense Department uh, for training. Then that that worked fantastically well. And then Alan said, "Let's do the real thing," and that's how we got to here. 
we just, uh, Alan's team was part of Y Combinator Research. They were a peer group to uh, Sam Altman's uh, OpenAI. And so when and Sam was actually funding us, so, uh, so OpenAI spun out, Sam decided he wanted to go do that, and then the, 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 the UI group, the, the HARC it was called, uh, came to join, a lot of them came to join me to create Croquet. So that's how we launched this business, uh, and uh, our goal was to literally create this ability for you and I to collaborate uh, in a way that hasn't been possible before. Uh, and that's what that's why it's so exciting to me, is we we have this virtual oper this operating system. Croquet is an OS, and it, it enables these virtual machines on your system and on mine to run bit identical. So now we can actually do really complex and amazing things together. But the programming is is it's a basically the same uh, amount of work and effort and complexity as doing a single user app. So it changes the paradigm completely, but it's necessary. It's necessary to achieve, you know, this idea of this augmented conversation that Alan and I started talking about, you know, a few decades ago. So we're right yeah. there. And when I think about what, when I think about AR and VR, AR is going to be an amazing communication platform. The metaverse is a communication platform, and it needs a way of ensuring that we have this shared truth. That's why we built it. Absolutely. Is there any projects within Crack Cage you'd like to share with us that, that's really exciting at the moment? Um, we've got a number of things going on that are really kind of cool. Um, one is, um, uh, how do I put it? I have to be careful because the, 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 there's some, some NDAs here. But the um, one is uh, uh, digital twins are a huge deal. And yeah, I don't think people understand just how important th this is going to be. But the idea of being able to get live data streams from devices, imagine a factory floor where you're actually able to see, first of all, see the, the current state of that factory floor. You know, and, 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 but more importantly, you can then engage with it. You know, everything's, it's software rules the world. Uh, and so... When you have this this, this digital twin, this virtual version, uh, virtual and live together version of the system, you're able to see what's going on. You're also able to modify what's going on. But a third leg of that is you're able to create a version of that that is completely simulated. So now you can start doing what if analysis of, mm. of, 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 the, of that system. So you can say, oh, the factory is this, but what if we move this over here and do this and and then and then run it? So so the the, the magic thing about spreadsheets, um, Dan Dan Bricklin uh, and, and Bob Frankson invented that, uh, and that's what made the Apple II the most important computer of that time. By the way, it wasn't just because you could do your finances that you could do you took your checkbooks. It allowed businesses for the very first time to do what ifs, you know, kind of imagine if, if this happens, what, how's that impact my business? And so basically spreadsheets were really simulation engines that allowed you to model your business and then fine tune it. Well, we're about to see the same thing for everything that's out there. A digital twin is going to enable you not just to see what's going on right this moment, but to do the what ifs. Yeah. And that what if is going to transform things because now you're no longer just like, it's going from you know paper ledgers in business to the spreadsheet transformed what was possible. People don't understand how big an impact that had in the way you managed your company, as the way you understood your company. Same thing is about to happen here, and it's going to be powered by this ability to uh, project that information into the space, first of all, but then do the, the, that what if. And again, that's why that shared truth, because it's not just me that's looking at this information and brainstorming about how we can improve things. You're in there with me, and you're, gonna, you're just going to say, it, it's like this super whiteboard that's live. And you say, what about this? And that's just magic. That's going to transform 
uh, every industry. Absolutely. I can see, I mean, to take an example of the aviation, I mean, if you can have that digital twin of that of a plane with an engine part that's about to fail, yep. well, mm-hmm. could see it fail, you know, and you, in that's real right. time could that send that part to, say, Dubai and get it fixed. Now, that can save the airline money, but also can save lives. And I think that is probably, I totally agree. I think digital twins is going to be the most important piece of tech we we'll probably see this this decade, this century. I think this is just it is I, that I think big. So. Yeah. yeah. People talk about the you know the the AR cloud, and that's certainly a really cool idea. But when you start getting to brass tacks, of, you know what was the spreadsheet's impact? When you it, it it revolutionized business, and we're going to see that same revolution here. It's really mm. important, I think, that you know the the we have the early parts of these metaverse systems. Businesses have to start using them today because. Yeah. That are really about, you know, it's going to take off. You're going to see these transformations occur so fast. Like I said, we're on an exponential curve right now, and, and when you're right there, it's kind of at this, you know, uh, uh, this this level, right? But it's about to do this, and mm. that's going to be, you know, it's like then you see it. But then if you've been on it, you're going to say, oh, cool. If you haven't, you're down here, and you say, how do I get from here to here? That's why you have to get into this now, to understand it and be a part of it and actually decide how that thing is going to evolve. Mm. You know, the history of the future is being created right now, and most people don't aren't even aware of it. So it's really essential, I think, that people understand this stuff and start exploring it and, and 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 even more important, telling people like me what what you see and what you need, because you know I'm building a system that's pretty general purpose, but my job here, my job is to solve problems, and so I need to know what those problems are. So people, you know, working with us or working with people like me is essential to for for us to be able to make all this happen in a way that's useful to you. Hmm. Absolutely. Um, well, enjoying the conversation here today, David. Uh, is there anything I didn't ask but should? Um, that's a really good question. I, I, you know, I have some opinions about AI as an example, which I think is going to, as I said, it's an integral part of what we're doing, but it's also a very scary thing. Yeah. You know, you think about AIs uh, being used by. Uh, social network companies, for example. What do those AIs do? Well, their, their job is, first of all, to understand you, sort of create a model of who you are. But in doing that, then they can use that model to say, hey, this model would like this, so let's let's send that to him, right? So it's sort of trying to reconstruct what you care about, what you're interested about. Uh, that That's one. The other is if that model gets good enough, you can actually use it and say, what happens if I do this to the model? In other words, can I change the, the target user's behavior, not just you know, try to figure out what he wants, but get him to want something? So I see AIs are going to be very good at that. And sort of, that's a game, that, and AIs are very, very good at games. When we look at AR and VR, this, this AI that I talked about inside of a, the AR space that's working for me and for you, it can't be one of those. It has to be a, a, a an AI that not only helps us but defends us against those others. You well, know, it's got to be yeah. what I call a prophylactic AI. It's got to be the thing that its job is to uh, help you solve your problems, but also keep you safe. Mm. And I don't think there's not any work being done on that that kind of AI right now. We see it as essential, because can you imagine if that AI was owned by a social network and that AI is gonna have a very strong um, urge to tell you to do things that may not be what you really need, aren't in your best interest. We need AIs that care about us, not about some other entity. So that's a big issue that's going to be, we'll be facing, and we're gonna be facing a lot sooner than you think. You know, we're, mm. you are looking at chat GDP is something that's really a remarkably good. 
Well, we're on an exponential curve where now we're being able, being able to see how good AI is getting. It's yeah. real for us. We're it's like and and it's it's an exponential curve. Five years from now, it's going to be extraordinary. That means we have to start thinking about these problems, these prophylactic AIs, these AIs to defend us. We have to start thinking about them now. Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. I mean, having I dare say have an ethical AI. Well, that's, that's right. Yeah, absolutely. Which, and what an idea, huh? That's, that's, that is a brilliant idea, actually, because, and also, I think, I'm going to get really nerdy here. You think we really, really need to get into general AI? I mean, I know there's a lot of research into it, but can we just keep it at narrow? Is that, is that you think, is, do you think general AI is a bit of a genie in the bottle that we shouldn't really take out? I don't yeah. know. I mean, it's kind of out. Yeah. Uh, the trick is we, we need to start thinking about uh, I mean, these things are out there. They're, and, and one problem I see is, and you put it, you nailed it so well, is an ethical AI has to be trained to be ethical. Hmm. And, and we're not training things that way. We're training them. Here's every bit of information in the world. Now, now the problem is without foundations. Uh, you know, it's like when you raise a child, you raise it to be ethical, right? You want the child to respect people. You want the child to have certain motivations. Or you want them to not do things that might harm them. But your job as a parent is to train that child to be a good human. Well, if if you just said, you know, th threw the kid out and say, good luck learn all everything you possibly can try to make sense of it without some sort of structure some sort of um you know uh, uh basis some sort of moral structure there it's going to be you're going to create an, uh, an insane ai hmm. it has no value proposition it doesn't know what's important what's not this is one of the reasons ais lie they can't tell the difference and they don't care there's no reason for them to be worried about truth, every every bit of information to them has the same value proposition. So, so you need to think that. This is, by the way, I think why Isaac Asimov was so important with his laws of robotics, because he was saying, here's this moral foundation that gets laid on uh, how how a robot should think and how a robot should act. We don't ha we we need that, but we need it in terms of how do you create a a good AI, as just like as a parent, we want to make a good human. Hmm. Interesting. Very interesting. Very interesting point to wrap up. Um, here, yeah, David, this morning. Um, finally, where else can we find you? Uh, croquet is at croquet.io, and uh, we've got a number of really cool projects going on right now. Um, in fact, the first one you'll see as soon as you get to our website is a thing called Web Showcase. And we made a system that allows you to add a, a, a virtual world, a metaverse world, onto your own homepage on, on uh, WordPress uh, with no code. And it's wonderful. It has uh, Dolby Spatial AI. So it, it, it's, um, audio. Dolby it's Spatial audio, audio. Yeah. audio. Yeah. <laughs> they don't do it special audio so you can talk to somebody in the world you can invite your friends into you know it's like so if a company builds uses this they're you know they basically have created uh their 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 front showroom and they can and their content is in there you go in there and and you know get your wife to come with you to see yeah, this is what they're doing so that that we're really excited about that you know that that just that literally just came out we won uh, product hunt number one uh, on, on that one, and uh, the, as I said, the uh, the WordPress plugin just is coming out like uh, last week, so it's very very new. And, and the other stuff we're doing, um, like I said, some of the stuff I can't talk about, but it, it's actually uh, a big deal. I think we're about to uh, we're multiplayer gaming is foundationally hard. People do. I, in fact, one of the reasons we started the Croquet Project, I did a, this uh, 3D world with all these different objects in it, and every one of them had a different network model. You had to basically plug, you know, wire these things up. That's how all multi-user works today. The stand, rule of thumb is 
multi-user apps are two to three times the level of effort to do over a single user app because you have that wiring problem. And you change a feature, you have to rewire it. Uh, Croquet gets rid of that. And so one of the things we have coming is going to basically fix multi-user game programming, which I'm really, really excited about. Fantastic. I can't tell you what it is, but it's going to be cool. Okay. <laughs> keep it on your hat. We'll, we'll keep the watch the space now. So, yep. David, thank you very much for, for your time, and, and oh, we'll check in with you in probably a year, year or so's time and see how much things have really have grown. Yeah, well, thank you so much, and uh, uh, take care. It was, it was wonderful. It's been an absolute privilege chatting to you today. Thank you for coming on to the thank show. You. Yep. Uh,